I'm going to talk um, today about quality management and control, and uh, it's the first of two lectures that lead into um, process and the, the cover kind of process and management in, in construction. And the most sort of uh, popular or modern um, implementation of this process improvement is something called lean management. And it's been, um, it's been worked on quite a bit in, um, in construction, and I've mentioned it a few times in the course of, of, my, of my lectures. So there's two lectures, and they kind of, they kind of uh, complement each other. And um, I realized when I first started teaching this and researching on this field that actually the quality management, the quality control was intimately, inti intimately linked with, with uh, lean management. You can't quite separate them. So I've, I've kind of dovetailed these two lectures together. And quality management control is a separate subject, really. Um, but they're so closely linked and they, they fit so well together that I've kind of decided to teach it in that way. <clears throat> so this is going to be a... Um, straightforward lecture on that. And then we will have, um, there was some question asked about um, week 11. <clears throat> we will have two lectures on week 11 next week. But there's only going to be one, election, one lecture on week 12. That's the Wednesday of week 12, which is after everything is due, after you've finished everything. But it's just a summary wrap up. It's a chance to talk about the module and, and to sort of fit up any, any loose ends that we might have about the material. Try and kind of pull it all together into one coherent thing as best we can. So uh, anyhow, this is quality management control. And it's really about, um, it's really about definitions and management, um, something about service innovation and how there's a, um, a move towards back office or um, sort of things you don't see, the payment of sy systems, the way the bills are processed, um, paperwork as it, as it were. And um, I'll also introduce um, something called statistical process control. Um, have I talked about this before? No. No. I'm just, I might have mentioned it here and there. Right, OK. And then really what the, um, talk about what the, what, what the definition of quality is. It's one of those terms that has a very broad and quite a powerful meaning, certainly in, in, in English. And um, it's so closely linked with industrial output or with uh, with, um, with, with manufacturing, that it's almost impossible to, to separate it. So the idea that, that quality management is integral, and there's actually, there's actually standards and so forth, so there's actually a quality management process and procedure. So it's quite, it's quite a developed and sophisticated managerial practice. And um, um, one, one way to, to access this, and the most likely way that you are ever going to practice this particular um, activity, this particular task, is if it's a company's in crisis or a company's problematic. You know, what do you actually, how do you actually deal with it? How do you pull it out of its crisis? Um, and so quality, lean management, they're all quite connected. And the, the way we access it is by looking at a company that's having a problem, that's having, that's having uh, problems. So anyhow, I did mention that quality was one of those terms that uh, had a very obscure, um, a, a very broad and obscure kind of quite philosophical kind of meaning. It can be um, sort of the characteristic of, a, of an object, something that's very pure. So a block of ice that happens to have no contaminants in it, you might say is high quality ice. Or if you go to the opera and you, you particularly like the performance, that could be a high quality um, a thing like that, or it's um, it's something about achieving an excellence at some level. So you're reaching a standard that, that that's unsurpassable, you know. So you 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 get, and then also could mean sort of the meaning, the actual meaning of excellence itself. And I think one way to look at um, um, some of the more intricate, some of the more subtle aspects of of quality is to look at something called the paradox of quality. And um, we'll talk later about um, one of, the, one of the, the fundamental principles of quality management is that it, it, the, the, quality of, um, the quality of the object or the part has to be conformal to requirements. In other words, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, then it's not, you can't judge it in terms of quality. And this is the perfect example of that. This is a, this is a 
a, um, a painting by uh, an Italian called uh, Caravaggio. And uh, he painted this painting in, in an attempt to, um, to recover his name, his good name, and to pay back. He was giving it to, the, he had murdered someone. The painter had actually murdered someone. And um, he, the, the family or the friends of this guy um, <coughs> tried to kill him and they chased him out of um, Italy and, he, and they went, he went to Naples and then to Sicily and then to Malta. He spent most of his life on the run. And he painted a series of paintings um, to try and recover his good favor. He was the greatest painter of his age. One of the greatest painters that ever lived, in my opinion. But he tried to recover his name by painting a series of paintings to give to the, as a gift to the people who he wanted, who wanted to kill him. <laughs> um, well, it didn't work. And uh, this painting in particular, it, we know exactly what Caravaggio looked like because he painted a picture of himself. This is David, David and Goliath. And he painted a picture of himself with his head, as Goliath with his head chopped off. So we know, and he's, he's actually appeared in a number of paintings um, of himself, always someone who's been martyred or badly treated in some way. Um, so anyhow, the painting failed completely. It's one of the greatest masterpieces of um, sort of, uh, um, yeah, it's one of the greatest masterpieces of art, and yet it didn't work. So um, I wanted to try and bring this home a little bit to our, <clears throat> to our industry, to what we do, to try and make it a little bit more, um, to try and make it a little bit more um, pertinent or relevant. And um, you can just think about what, what issues of quality have, have relevance to, to our industry. And I think the, perf the perfect example is health and safety. And there's been a drive, oh, maybe over the last 20 years, I guess, to improve health and safety in construction. So health and safety now is, is amongst the safest industries in the country, actually, working construction. And that's just because it's been a relentless drive. There's been a very good executive, the health and safety, HSC, the health and safety executive. And they've actually, what looks like a very carefully written quality management system in place that's national, that, that goes, extends um, throughout the whole country, that's monitored, that's improved and updated when new equipment and new systems come into place. They adapt to it when a new contaminant is found, for example, that, that's, that's, that's um, potentially dangerous. Um, and it's active. You can get fined. You can have your job shut down. If you, you can have incredible um, penalties imposed upon you if you, if you lead to uh, someone being injured or killed on site. So, um, so they, what it looks like is a sort of widespread quality implementation and management system seems to have had a big effect on health and safety. But there are other things as well, things that we might have much greater touch, touching with, uh, greater uh, sort of engagement with. Things like bid writing, estimation, scheduling and planning, we're working a bit on that this year about how to, how to produce a high quality schedule, a high quality bid. Uh, budgeting and forecasting, we talked about that as well. Environmental management, control of various, uh, various things. Um, and then um, the, the, the fact the actual assembly seems to be the last thing we, we, we seem to, we, we, we end up worrying about. How you actually put together and assemble the building. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about health and safety because I think it really is um, a perfect example of how a, a broad scale quality management control system has been implemented and has actually um, proved to be successful. Something like a failure, how, so, how, so health and safety is a quality issue. Um, it fails when, um, when you fail near to develop a reasonable plan, a site plan, uh, or um, a method statement. Um, and um, sort of inappropriate or incomplete plan if you gloss over one aspect of the, of the risks associated with, with the job. Um, failure to obligation, you highlight something but there's no process, downstream process to change things at all. And um, changing conditions, um, if for some reason they switch machinery, you have a different type of machine that presents a different sort of risk to the operators and to the management, you don't actually change the plan as a result of that. So these are these sort of things that um, it's <coughs> worth looking at. And of course um, there's sort of a, very, a fairly standard way to um, implement quality management things. And I'll talk about it in context here because it's, 
it's a fairly general a managerial approach to this thing. I'll talk about it again. Um, I'll give a very similar kind of figure. Um, but what, what we have is a, um, we have improvements. We, we, we make a decision that there will be a um, quality improvements. Um, we, we, we issue what these quality things are. Um, and then you have, end up with two teams. One of them is a quality team management, so the upper level management team. And the other one is the implementation team. So these two teams, they work in tandem with each other. And this is a very common way, a uh, very appropriate and very common way to manage these things. That way you can go from site to site or from location to location as a team, one doing the managerial aspects, worrying about the um, its inspections, the recording and categorizing, the formalization of the process and procedures, um, linking these with the um, accepted standards, signing off on all that kind of stuff. And then it's these managerial things are connected with the corporate, the larger corporate health and science, health and safety policy, the site management plan, um, the, uh, the training systems in place, uh, the assessment, sort of assessment that needs to be done on a regular basis, and whatever additional factors. And then this leads into the implementation team. So the implementation team is constantly fed up-to-date information about how, or up-to-date policy on how to actually implement these things. So I'll talk more about this uh, in a little bit, but I just wanted to give you a, a, a flavor of how these, these things are actually done. They're, they tend to be quite formalized in some sort of org chart. So this is actually, this was work that was done um, at a plant at Amuda. It wasn't a construction plant, they were doing off-site manufacturing. And I, and I went, I visited, I figured out what they were doing. So um, just to say that quality, um, quality management, quality control techniques actually can, can be applied to any kind of process. So any, anything like manufacturing, um, services. Um, the roots, of course, are in the craft and engineering field, but it can equally be applied to administrative processes and so forth. In fact, that seems to be the thing that it's le more leading towards that. And um, um, of course, at the same time, we're um, at the same time we're worried about health and safety, and of course about quality in general. We're improving our processes in general. So there's a general overall um, sort of push towards improving the processes. Processes, I mean, you make an order, the order is delivered, you, um, you receive the order, you um, install the, the component, you check the component. These, these are what I mean by processes. And the real, the real, um, the real question, the real um, challenge we have as managers is, you know, is the cost of implementing and managing health and safety worth the expense of the activity. So is it, does it, are the benefits um, proportional to the, um, the costs? And um, I think it's worth talking a little bit about the history of, of quality control, because it, it's not something that came up out of, out of blue skies. And it, indeed, it's, it's got a long and fairly sort of illustrious history. Now, it wouldn't, you wouldn't think that looking at some of the manuals, uh, because it's quite tiresome. There's something called um, Six Sigma, which is these implementation quality management systems. Some, some of you may have, might have had experience with them if you worked in a company that went through a, a Six Sigma process. Or there's another one, there's an ISO uh, 6000 series where you ensure that all of the processes within your organization are up to a certain quality. In other words, there are checks and balances. There's, um, there's a um, command and control structure in place. Um, there's a ac accurate record keeping and management of that sort of thing. But anyhow, these, these, all of these things have quite, um, a, quite a distinguished kind of history. And much of it came from things like interchangeable parts in the arms industry. I'll talk more about this. This idea that you have to have a uniformity of uh, you have to have a uniformity of components um, that can be made in different locations. That because if you're at war, you might put your factories out of the way of the gunfire. And, uh, and then you would have <coughs> multiple factories that would produce the same parts. Of course, it would be completely useless if, you can't, if they're not interchangeable. And war is the perfect 
sort of challenge to uh, ensure that parts are interchangeable. You know, you have a big, expensive weapon that you bring out into the field, one little part breaks, and you, it's completely useless. You need an entire system behind it in order to make sure it works. Worst comes to worst, you pick up another one, and you, you pick up, you use a parts gun, and you pick up one, and so forth. So this whole thing. And the, a lot of when this stuff became formalized was at the, the rebuilding of, of post-war Japan, because um, Japan had been a quite a um, fairly sophisticated industrial power before uh, World War II, and it was flattened by, mostly by the Americans in, um, during the war. And um, because of that, they had this incredibly fragmented manufacturing base. So no single factory was left standing. There were sort of parts of a factory, parts of a machine car, and many of the men had been killed, many of the people had been killed. So it was, it, was a, it was a highly fragmented system that they were dealing with. And the only way to do that was to ensure that there was some standardization. There was some quality management system in place. Um, and um, of course, in construction, we're a bit slapdash about things. You know, you can always cover it up with a bit of plaster and so forth. But actually, these these days are kind of ending. We're we're dealing with off-site manufacturing, just-in-time delivery, um, all of these um, components fitting in together that are built in dozens of different places. It looks more like a car factory. A building site looks more like a car factory than it does um, the built the building sites of old. Um, so. Um, and I think if you really want to see some of these exacting principles put into place, look at industries like pharmaceutical or food production. The tolerances and the, the attention to detail and the purity, the clarity of, of the, um, the, the, the systems, the cleanliness of these systems is, is astonishing. If you ever visit a pharmaceutical production facility, um, the, um, the extent they go to to ensure that contamination is not, there's a uniformity to production, um, that is, is extraordinary. And if we, if we had something like that in our industry, it would be, it would be good. Um, now, the first principle to think about is something called quality circles. And this, this again, was something that was, came out of post-war Japan when um, they had many different, the companies were fragmented, so they had sales and marketing in one area. They had um, manufacturing one part in one factory, one destroy, half destroyed factory, they're managing another part, another, and they're kind of assembling in a third. And every once in a while they had to get together to discuss um, the process, what's going on with the quality. And so they set up these quality circles where they all sit around in a circle, and the circle follows the flow, the, the flow of the of the manufacturing, everything from um, sales and ordering on one side to um, uh, sort of parts and uh, materials ordering next to them and then design next to them and then um, one factory and then the other factory and then the third factory and you kind of sit around up, everyone's sitting next to the person they're delivering to or they're receiving from. So there's kind of a flow the, the, the flow of people around, the, the order of people around the circle matches the flow of materials through the system. So the idea behind it, if you want to talk to the person upstream from you, he's on one side, downstream from you, he's on the other side. So you actually can negotiate and discuss and look, start looking at the, the process as a, as a river, as a flow. And um, the other thing is notion, um, these, this zero defects notion. <clears throat> this is when I get back to this, to this uh, paradox of, um, of, of of um, quality. Um, so Phil Crosby is one of the um, sort of the, the, the founders of this Six Sigma and this the, the, the kind of quality movement. And um, the um, came up with these three, four principles that were really um, standard. One is that quality is conformance to requirements. I mentioned that earlier. That means that no matter how beautiful it is, it still has to do the job it was intended to. The other thing, uh, defect, defect prevention is much better than, is much preferred to lots of inspection and recalls. So fix it upstream before you sell it and you have to deal with it downstream. And then zero, zero defects is the quality standards. And we all know that actually when you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of parts, zero defects is almost impossible. But that's actually the, so now in, in certain industries like the microchips, they're talking about Parts, 
parts per trillion or something, you know, the, the, the amount of defects um, that you think. And, um, <clears throat> and then, and then qual quality, quality is measured in monetary terms. So for each defect, there's a price associated with it. Now, it depends, of course, how far out into the system it gets. If it actually gets sold and has to be recalled, then the price is higher. Um, I mentioned already a couple times this six sigma. Six, six, six big is, sigma, as you know, is a standard deviation. So six sigma is um, an even more exacting requirement. The idea behind zero defects is that you're already into six sigma. In other words, there's no room for, um, for error or defects in, in the system. And the six sigma book, if you can go, there's a, there's a stack of them up in the library. It's about that thick. And you would buy this book, and you'd hire a team, or you'd get someone working for you, and they would implement this Six Sigma six, six system in your company, in your organization. Which means visiting all your plants, looking at your suppliers, looking at your customers, seeing how your systems work. So it's a full quality management ritual that you go through. Um, <coughs> And of course, it's linked in beautifully with the other systems that we're going to talk about, lean management, which I'm going to get to later on. So it's intricately linked with that. But I'll, I'll wait till next week to talk about that. Um, so anyhow, you have things like um, customer demands. There's a whole section on man managing the customer expectations and the rhythm or the, the way that, um, that the things are ordered. Um, so there are performance metrics that are included in the Six Sigma system um, about linking customer requirements with quality, organizational, and commercial improvements. Some customers don't actually require such high. It's actually not the great. They don't really need it. They need a different sort of, of delivery. Um, and then lean process systems implemented to eliminate waste. And I'm going to get to that later on. And of course, so much of this is associated with systems or processes to measure, analyze, improve, and control. And nothing works without good, good leadership and management. So none of these systems work without a top-down managerial leadership kind of um, system in place. So anyhow, the six big sigma leads very beautifully into what we think, what we refer to as, as lean management. But we'll get to that later on. And of course, um, these are enshrined in, um, in these international standards. So the BS is the British standard, and the ISO is the international standards, and often they're the same or similar. Um, and then these are just a few of them. There are dozens of them. And they're quality management systems, safety management, environmental management. So these are just the three. But um, if you really want to look through them and see what they are, you can read some of them. So I actually participated brief, very briefly on the development of the standard for BIM. Um, and it's a real, it's a really exacting, they work, it's, they're these sort of user manuals, really, more than anything else. But they're really precise and exacting, and it takes a certain kind of uh, character to see them through. It's, it's not, it's, they're not easy to produce. And right now we're waiting for, we're still waiting for the final BIM standards to be um, produced. They haven't actually been, so... I don't know if you've been hearing about level two, level three BIM. Well, we don't actually have a, a standard for level three. There is, no, there is no standard for how you share a model on a cloud system. I mean, we can get it to work in the lab, but to actually get it to work in real life with lots of people do, dealing with it is, is, not, is not feasible yet. Uh, so, so we're waiting on that. Um, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Um, now I'll go through this. So I'll talk about the ISO 9001 2008. I think this is the latest one. And this is a quality management document. Um, so this is what the construction company would have as their standard. Um, so you, you would have this, in, you would have a copy of this in your head office. You would ensure that the top upper management understood it and would have read it. And the whole thing deals with uh, business management things, key management process, interactions, and um, it's also, there's also a, um, a quality management system that it conforms to. Um, so the whole purpose of it is really to establish a, an effective quality management system. 
and um, information of, of a, of a manage, managerial quality policy. And, um, and uh, integral to this is sort of a continuous improvement. So these things are never static in any way. There's always sort of forging on or changing. There's always something that's being improved. You're, you're systematically cycling through it. So you're going through it again and, and fixing it, and going back to the beginning. As, as problems and mistakes enter into the system, you have to redo them and refocus on them. Um, and then, yes, providing a reference document of some sort. Um, I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to talk about um, statistical process control, because I think it is something that I had no idea how it was done until I saw it in practice in a factory once. And <clears throat> what it was was a, a company that were making a part. It was a metal part, had a hole in the middle, and it was kind of had a flange on it. And they were making thousands of these things. It was for a clutch, I think. And um, they were making thousands of these things. They were really identical. And there was a guy working on a lathe. It was actually an automatic, uh, numerically controlled lathe. But he would, he would receive the blocks. Um, cut to a certain length, he would put them in the lathe, they would run the lathe, and then automatically push a button, it would run the lathe, and then he would take it out and put it. And he was making thousands of these things. There were pallets of these things stacked high like that. And um, you would think, uh, well, these things were very critical. If the hole in the middle wasn't exactly right, yeah, they were, they were drilling a hole in it, and they were using something called a reamer, a reaming or a, some kind of thing to, to make sure you have a precisely dimensioned hole. And of course, he was making thousands of these things, and these tools were running out. They were they were wearing down. They were getting the tools were getting smaller and smaller uh, as they were getting worn out, and the as a, as a result, the holes were getting tighter and tighter. Were getting smaller. And, you know, this was over thousands of these things. So there had to be a way to sort of measure every. You couldn't measure every single one. You had to measure every thousand or every pallet or two and a pallet or something like that. Otherwise, you'd just go nuts measuring all these things. You would start introducing errors that way. Um, so the way that they do it is they, they pick out, so this is just this, um, these are the dimensions, this is this hole. So um, this is the part number. Um, yeah, it's a CNC operation. And the part number was a 6651101 housing. So it's a housing for a clutch. And it had a tolerance between 38.070 and 38.095 millimeters. That was the acceptable tolerance. But what they were doing is that they were actually picking not every single part, but every one in a thousand parts. So we're picking every thousand parts. But instead of making this tolerance realistic, they were making it much narrower. And it was actually the actual. So the real tolerance, if you put this real tolerance here, 338.070, is all the way up here. And the negative tolerance is 38.005 down here. So actually they were measuring it, but they were demanding a much tighter tolerance. The reason being is they were only doing one every thousand. So they would be missing 999 in there. So they were ensuring, in order to ensure that all of the parts fell within the acceptable tolerance, they were actually producing a measurable tolerance, which was much, much narrower. And they were measuring it. They would look, they would look at this thing going down, going down, going down, going down, going down, and if it exceeded this line, they would stop the production, they would change the tools, they would recalibrate everything, um, and they would start up again. So that's how this, this particular statistical process control. And of course, it's all based on these, um, it's all based on these, um, Gaussian or dis distributions, the statistical principle. And the, the target was right in the middle, but I mentioned earlier that what happens is um, as the tools wear down, the holes get ever, so, ever smaller. So you actually start the, um, you start the, uh, you actually buy a, a ream, you get, you, get your, you, you, you get your tooling ever so slightly bigger than what you actually need. And as it wears down, it shifts past the target into the area of non-conformance, the lower, so the upper limit and then the lower limit. And so you, you actually anticipate the fact that your tools are going to wear out, and as a result of that, your, the dimensions of your parts are going to change ever so slightly. 
So this is the idea behind statistical process control. It's being used, it's being used um, frequently. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, shift gears a little bit um, now to talk about um, computer systems. And, and I, you, can't get, um, you can't get far away from computerized systems because it's where, it's the direction the industry is going in. And we operate something called BIM. Um, construction industry operates something called BIM, but BIM is nothing more than a conglomeration of existing computer-based design and engineering systems. So BIM is just an elaborate version of computer-aided design, computer-aided engineering, computer-aided manufacturing, computer-aided process planning, that's when you plan out a sophisticated process. Um, quality insurance is done now within, uh, within BIM. Um, production, production planning and control, that's also it, the idea between, between 5D BIM is that you include these, start including these things. And then enterprise resource planning, when you actually control and plan <laughs> the entire enterprise based on um, your ability to computerize everything and manage it that way. So all of these systems have integral to them a quality management system. And part of what BIM offers us is a chance to man manage in a kind of coherent way the quality of, of, what, of what our products are, what, how, what we produce. So integral to all of this, all of the, the computer aspects, is this quality system. Now we're still piecing it together, in fact there's a lot of academic work going on right now on that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about these. You might, you might see some of, the, some of the, the complexity of this. For the BIM model, you have a shared model in here, and there's actually three main users of it. The structural, the, the MEP, the systems, and then the architectural, the, the shape, the design of the building. And they're actually working in the same, they're actually working on the same model. So it's the exact same computer file held in some cloud storage somewhere. So this would be sort of level three or level four BIM. Now all of the structural models, they would be dealing with sub-models. So, um, they would look and be looking at the fire, um, the emergency excavation, you know, the, the emergency evacuation, and so forth. And the MEP would be looking at sub models such as um, heat control and heat management, um, environmental standards, and so forth, and uh, heat retention. And then the architectural model, they they'd be doing things like hanging off the the cladding systems or looking at egress and ingress, or looking at whether it fits with the conservancy notion of what looks good. And of course, many of these models will have other models associated with it. So the facade model. So the people who came here to do the facade on this building, they had their own computer-aided design system, which at the time they didn't, didn't link with the BIM. But in the future, it will. So that the, 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 in order to integrate someone into in order to say a facade manufacturer, in order to integrate them into it, you present them with the same quality standards, you introduce them to the quality procedures, you invite them to join your shared model, you ensure that their interaction with the shared model complies and conformal with the process that you've instituted, and then once they're integrated in the, into the shared model, then they get to adapt to make sure that they have the updates and all of the engineering aspects are done in, in such a way that it's, um, that it's collaborative and fully collaborative and functional in that, in that respect. Um, now I'm um, thinking by now that some of you would be very concerned that all of these regiments and rules would actually inhibit something about the innovation or the creativity. You know, we're dealing with an architect. Architects are creative people, but actually engineers are as well. But, but that somehow you'd be, you'd be the sameness, everything would be exactly the same. You know, you'd end up with buildings, thousands of buildings that look identical with each other. Or, um, or, um, or lack of innovation in terms of process. You know, you're just very rigid and unable to change. That's the, that's the kind of risk of instituting all of these systems, is that the system, the, becomes so rigid itself that it can't adapt or change or it can't be creative. It kind of stifles creativity. And this is something that, um, that people actually worry about. You know, does this really, does the imposition of all these systems, all these, this big fat manual and all of these computer systems and control standards, are we becoming less and less creative? Are we becoming harder for us to actually 
create things that, that have some innovation associated with them? Um, well, the answer is, um, I hope not. Um, certainly, it wouldn't be to our advantage to, um, to, to sort of stifle our, 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 basic our basic ability to create new things. And um, the, um, the key to the system, and the key to make it um, sort of functional and, and in a way productive, is to develop systems that are cheap to fail, so that you, you can actually run the models, you can run your ideas through the models before you actually build it. Or you can, um, you can develop uh, future-proofing systems inside that allow you to change five or six years down the road once the building is built. So the, the innovation constantly has to be introduced into the system and maintained in the system. But the system itself shouldn't be an impediment to that, shouldn't actually stop it. In fact, it should make it cheaper and easier to run trial runs, to run models of, so, of certain sorts. So the concept behind it, regimentation and institution of all these sort of rules, is, um, is a good one. And the, the, principle, sort of the principle behind it has to be in step with innovation, which, which, is, what, which is what, in the end, what, is what leads to solution of bigger problems. <clears throat> and I'll talk more about this um, hiring conflict between innovation and regimentation later on when we talk about lean management, because you can see in practice that actually lean, lean affords you with, with greater flexibility in certain, in certain ways. Um, so let me just run through what I talked about today, and talk, and just to include it in the bigger, um, bigger <laughs> picture of what we're doing. Quality is, seems to be to, to, to be one of the key sort of pillars of what of what we do. We have to produce quality output given the, the budget we have and the time constraints that we're operating under. And one way to ensure that our quality is up to standard is to comply with standards and to engage with the standards and to um, to acknowledge that the standards themselves um, aid us in certain ways. And um, we should engage with these, um, these systems because they've been around for a while. And they've actually, um, it's the systems themselves, the quality management control systems, that have actually aided us in periods in period of industrial history when things were, were, pretty, were pretty tough. And, um, and that, um, in the end, um, service innovation, <coughs> innovation in our processes and systems, comes about through um, observation and, and coherence or compliance with the quality standards. And that these, in turn, allow us access to other, to other systems and paradigms, for example, lean management, which is what I'm going to talk about next time. And then um, behind it all is an awful lot of science, and statistical process control is a pretty good example of this. It's a way to actually manage your production and your, the quality of your of your regular production in such a way that you would, uh, with a minimum of intrusion, ensure that the, that the quality of your materials is up to scratch. Anyhow, I'd say um, that's my lecture for today. I'm sorry, my, my voice isn't that great. And um, I'm, I'm keeping it.